Thanks. Again, my name is Matt Bruzek. Thank you all for coming. I know there's a lot of other talks and tracks to go to. Um, we're going to talk about the evolution of Kubernetes model. Basically, my job is Kubernetes. And if you need Kubernetes help, find me afterward. I'll be in the developer room. Um, and we can talk Kubernetes or, or anything. Um, but what, what, what we're going to do today is we're going to go over um, how, how we've uh, evolved using uh, Kubernetes since 2014 and uh, what, what's changed and what's the what lessons we've learned. Okay. So our journey for uh, Kubernetes wasn't easy. Um, in the early days, it was really crazy. Everything was changing pretty fast. We learned a lot from our uh, with the, uh, we learned a lot, and our our solution has evolved along with the Kubernetes project. So, um, we've essentially iterated over Kubernetes over time, and I'm going to show you some of the older iterations and what where they were and what what were the uh, features there, and then how we we made it different and better. Um, but each rewrite uh, basically took advantage of new Kubernetes features or new Juju features or both. All right. And uh, who are we? Um, I work for Canonical. This is uh, the official way to, dis to display, to deploy Kubernetes on Ubuntu. So um, <clears throat> Kubernetes is a, is a mechanism to deploy, update, manage, and scale your application containers. Um, it comes from the Greek word helmsman. I, I'm hoping that if you're here, you kind of already heard of this before, but if you haven't, um, you can read the Google uh, board paper, um, and I've got a link there. Um, but it was basically announced in March of 2014. Um, how many people here are using Kubernetes? Okay, we got a few. That's great. Um, and, and we're going to talk about the way we've been using it. Um, so I'm just uh, going to focus on the things we learned here. Um, and not necessarily describing Kubernetes to everybody. So, um, all right. So this is the what slide. Uh, containers. What are containers? Um, containers are a method of virtualization, so you can have multiple isolated uh, systems on on instead of just one. So the isolation happens with namespaces and C groups, um, but it's it, and, and it shares the host kernel, so it's a very fast virtualization. Um, I'm going to make a distinction here between application containers and machine containers. Application containers are, are um, what you would know as Docker and Rocket. Um, machine containers are Lex C and now we call them Lex D. Um, and a machine container is, is, is essentially a, a full system. It appears to be a full system. So it's got an init, init system, it's got SSH, um, you, can, uh, you can do cron tab and everything in, in a machine container. But an application container is one single process running in a in a container, or at least that's the uh, the optimal way to run with application containers. Um, and why are we talking about Kubernetes? Well, the the explosive popularity of containers um, it's just exploded. So people are using them a lot more. They're breaking up their monolithic application into many many multiple containers, and so you need software to manage those things. Um, Again, we, we have the different container technologies. There's more than just uh, Docker. There's LexD, Rocket, etc. And um, but be, because of the popularity, we need a way to coordinate them. Um, this is a graph of the interest over time since the inception of Docker. Um, all right. So managing Kubernetes is not necessarily easy, and and we're not talking about just installing Kubernetes here. We're talking about managing it over its lifetime. Um, and as Chuck had mentioned in the last talk about etcd and things like that. So, but back in the early days, the, the way to install, the official way to install was literally uh, curling a, a bash script and then piping that into uh, bash, pseudo bash. So no operation team in the world is going to let you uh, install anything that way because um, somebody could do something malicious and insert something that, that would, uh, would, would hurt your systems. So. Um, also, there's things out there like Kubernetes the hard way, um, and there's other one-step commands to bring up the Kubernetes clusters, but some of those tools are not portable. They, they can't run in different clouds. Maybe some of them are just for Amazon or just for GCE, or uh, some of them maybe just are you know, using Vagrant images on your local laptop. So, but the uh, Juju solution that we have is it, it, it collects the operational knowledge for these things we call charms, but it deploys on any cloud, any 
any cloud that we have, uh, it, it deploys any public cloud and even bare metal and, and, and again my laptop. So, um, so operating Kubernetes by hand is not very portable. So we, we have collected all this operational knowledge and put them in something we call charms um, so that they can be shared and improved upon, iterated on. Um, and uh, like I said, these are uh, deployable to many different clouds. Um, we have a large library of existing applications in, Kuber in Juju, and that has uh, given us um, power to integrate with different applications, which I'll show in later slides. All right, so uh, Kubernetes explained. Um, Kubernetes is a declarative, uh, a declarative um, uh, system. So operators declare what you want the system to look like, and then Kubernetes works diligently to try to get there, try to get to that uh, spot. Uh, Chuck mentioned etcd. Etcd is the official uh, distributed key value store of Kubernetes, and the smallest unit of a, of in Kubernetes is a pod. It's not an application container, it's, it's actually um, a pod, and that can be multiple application containers because they'll share an IP address, They'll share um, a namespace, and they'll share uh, possibly uh, attached volumes, things like that. So we're not we're not operating uh, containers. We're actually operating pods in, in uh, Kubernetes. All right, and this is some pseudocode, um, very simplified pseudocode of what the what the scheduler actually does um, in Kubernetes. So it runs infinitely, and it it tra takes the difference between the desired state and the current state, and then it tries to schedule that. So if, uh, if a node goes down or if something, uh, you know, once it gets to equilibrium and gets to where, where it is, there's no delta, so there's no scheduling being done. But if a node fails or it gets, it gets, uh, it gets shut down, it will re-deploy uh, those, those pods on different, uh, on different nodes. So this is the simplified uh, way to, to talk about that. Um, it's, it's working on the eventual consistency uh, pattern. And again, uh, the, the operators are, correct, are, are creating YAML files or JSON files to, to de define the desired state, and it just works at, at getting there. Um, so for more information, you can go and read the Kubernetes docs, but this is just, again, very simplified. All right, so um, our, this is an actual picture of our, uh, first, our first model of Kubernetes. Um, we actually built it from, um, from several components that we already had. We already had a Docker, uh, a Docker component. We already had um, etcd, but uh, we wrote the Kubernetes master and the Kubernetes uh, components. Um, and as you see, they're, they're linked up there where they, where they connect, and those are called relations. Um, Juju is a modeling tool, so we modeled it with these components that we had available at the time. And we, you know, we a added more model or more um, operational knowledge into the model. Uh, each one of those are, are are a charm, and they have their own operations there. Um, and again, this is from the Juju GUI. This does not show how many how many um, uh, VMs are behind it. That's a that's a separate uh, view on the GUI. But uh, in this in this in this instance, we have three etcds um, and three Kubernetes Kubernetes units with Docker and Flannel running on all those. So, but again, this is a very iter early iteration and it's, uh, it was very much a proof of concept. Um, but in the early days, there were Kubernetes had minions. It was great. They're, uh, they're cute, little, uh, cute little workers that, that do all the work for the masters, right? This is, this is an original Kubernetes concept, uh, minions. Um, and, and for the second iteration, we, we did all in one, we did an all in one kind of approach. Um, there's, a, there's a container called Hypercube that contains all of the services that you would run in a Kubernetes uh, in deployment. The API server, the controller manager, et cetera. Um, we, we did run etcd on separate, ho separate hosts, and we also ran Flannel on the host VM, but, but um, we, we thought, when we were developing this, we thought, well, we have to run kubelet on our nodes anyways. Why, why not just run the, the, uh, the, 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 the Kubernetes master components as well, such as the API server, on the, the, the minions as well. So our second iteration looked a little bit like this. 
Um, this is, uh, you'll, you'll see that the, the GUI is a little bit different in uh, this iteration. We, we, this is an evolving uh, thing. So Juju is evolving as well as Kubernetes here. Um, and again, it hides the complexity because we have, in this example, three Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes units and three etcd units. So you don't see the number of, of uh, systems here, but it was a very simple model. And it was very um, easy to, to iterate, and, and it was very easy to deploy because we were just using the Hypercube image. Um, but running all in one introduced a couple of points of failure that uh, we, were, uh, we were not aware of when we came up with it the first time. Uh, Kubernetes had, um, <coughs> it, it, Kubernetes uses some advanced features in Docker. Um, and so each Docker update would, was problematic. We could have uh, we could have failures or, or setbacks because th it was using some advanced features that either were or were not running correctly in in the uh, in that version of Docker. Um, <clears throat> also, Hypercube itself, when we updated hi updated Hypercube itself, um, that was problematic because there were some uh, inconsistencies and in flags, some uh, regression errors there too. So um, so yeah, this all in one. Uh, model was also not flexible. Um, in Juju, we can request uh, uh, nodes or VMs with with a specific amount of CPU and a, and a specific amount of RAM for storage. We call those constraints. Um, and this all-in-one model made it impossible to to separate out um, and just give more CPU to, to certain uh, things like the minions. Um, so we also break separation concerns. And it, it, it was a it was a it was wasteful of you know CPU and network uh, b uh, resources that we were we were wasting running this all in one model. So, <clears throat> and about that time, um, the minions uh, the minions uh, terminology was it was expired. They 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 decided to go to rename every minion to Node. So goodbye. Little, uh, little cute little dudes. So um, that was about August 2014. So, so our our next iteration, and, and this is our current iteration, um, is is again it's pure vanilla upstream Kubernetes. This is uh, we're not editing um, any of these files or, or, or doing our own version here. Um, but this one we split out the, the the notion of the Kubernetes worker and the Kubernetes master, and again we still have etcd. But now we have uh, TLS with easy RSA. And we, we came up with a load balancer at the top that because of a, because of a, of a, of a bug in some of the Kubernetes code, um, you can list multiple API servers uh, when, you're, when you're connecting to, a, to the other <coughs> Kubernetes components. But it, it really only reads the first one for the master. So there may be several Kubernetes masters so what we did was we made a load balancer that would proxy the API requests directly to um, the, the, the right master, or any of the masters, and then we could scale the masters and the workers independently. Um, so, so that was one of, the, uh, one of the features that we added um, with our current iteration and some of, the, you know, some of the benefit we get from using that. So, so the master components, um, again, are the API server, the controller, and the scheduler. And those all run in system D now, so we can run them um, in, in Lex D containers if we need to. And the, the, the worker components, are, which is uh, Kubernetes and, or Kubelet and Proxy, those still run with uh, the application container um, Docker daemon. So, um, but again, we use etcd to create and uh, self-signed certificates <coughs> and give every component in the cluster a self-signed certificate. And, uh, and that this way we can scale up the just the workers because that's where you need the RAM and the CPU. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. So, uh, so then then we became upstream. We got into the upstream product. Uh, the project. Uh, if we look at the cluster slash Juju directory. That's where um, that's where our code lives. Um, it's a it's a large, fast moving project with thousands of contributors. So it is. It is difficult to keep up with, but we're doing a good job here. Um, everything is upstream. We're all uh, open source uh, in the in the master or in the official repository. So um, that was a, about April 2015. Um, so 
again, with, with Juju, with the reusable components in Juju, we can add, um, like in this example, monitoring and logging. Um, this, these are the Elasticsearch uh, charms. Uh, there is a Elasticsearch charm uh, connected to Kibana, and then the, uh, the top beat and the file beats are gathering data from uh, both the Kubernetes master and the Kubernetes worker. Um, but, but logging and monitoring is very specific to every individual solution. So we don't have this in our core bundle. Um, we have this as an add-on you can, you can add on. And if you want Prometheus or Nagios or some other monitoring technology, those are, those are doable to, to hook up to our, our existing model. Um, that, that's the, that's the, one of the power of Juju is its, it's interaction with other, other software and other technologies. So um, we're working on Prometheus and Nagios. So I don't know about you, but I learn best when we're by breaking things. So, um, so there, therefore, it must be cheap so that we can break things. We must be able to, to do it so we can iterate on this. Um, so through Juju, we've made the deployments of Kubernetes repeatable and dependable. I can deploy <coughs> this on Windows Azure, and I can deploy the same uh, model on, on my laptop or, or on uh, GCE. It, it doesn't matter. So it, it takes only a couple of minutes, and then I can deploy it. I can test my, my new uh, operations code, and if it broke, Okay, I destroy it and deploy a new one within literally minutes. Um, and the sooner you can, the sooner you can automate your deployments, the faster you can get to iterating. So, this is this is one of the big benefits we got with Juju. So, um, <coughs> lessons learned. So we did have some some uh, some education moments, uh, some some things we learned from this. Um, uh, manifests. We 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 forked some of the manifests because we had put some additional. Um, some additional variables in the add-ons manifests, such as uh, kubedns, heapster, grafana, influxdb. Um, and, but forking those made it very difficult to keep those up to date. We were actually several versions behind at one point. We've been, um, we came up with a really uh, good way, uh, automated way to, to update the add-ons when we're building these things we call charms. Um, and I told you about the proxying solution uh, for the load balancers, where it load balances uh, the requests. Um, we actually had a, a, some caching done in that proxy, and that was actually uh, found out. We had some errors in our E2E tests that we've resolved by, re by eliminating the caching. So if you're, if you're using a load balancer for the masters, don't cache. Um, and TLS is hard. I don't care who you are, it's hard. You need to you need to have it automated, and it needs to be re reproducible every time. So that if you're using uh, self-signed certificates, or if you have your own certificates, everything in the cluster has to be. Um, or doesn't have to be, but it, it, it's very secure if everything in the cluster has a TLS certificate. And you can set Kubernetes up. Uh, some of the one-step uh, ways in the Getting Started Guide don't use TLS certificates, but nobody's going to use that in, in production, right? So. Um, you need, to, you need to model or, or script or automate your TLS. It's hard always, so. Um, another thing, uh, the container network infrastructure, uh, we call that CNI. That's a plugin um, for, for Kubernetes. It's t still technically in beta in, in this, uh, at this time. It's uh, version 4.0, but it is ready. We've, we went from the Docker networking model to this container infrastructure networking model on our latest iteration. And it allows us to inter interact with other SDNs, such as Calico. And so we have Flannel and Calico uh, in our bundles right now. And we're looking to add others. OK, lessons learned uh, part two. Um, make it easy to debug your clusters, because there will be issues. Um, whether they're Kubernetes issues or etcd issues or you know, what have you, make it easy so you can get to your uh, clusters and you can get in there and, and debug. Um, some of the things we, we use are small containers for, uh, to debug networking. Um, if you don't know about BusyBox, it's a very, very small container. It's only about 1.1 megabyte. It's very fast to download. And then you can run that in your Kubernetes cluster if you wanted to try to debug some networking I issues, for instance. Um, I wouldn't use BusyBox for a uh, production uh, base level for your production uh, uh, containers. but. You, you, we did use it for debugging, and it was very useful, very small, and helped us find out some problems internally. Um, um, we, we had some uh, 
uh, oh, embrace change. There's some of the components uh, change on, on a minor release boundary that we've found some flags that are missing or, or that we were missing all of a sudden with, with a minor release of, of Kubernetes. So this will be uh, difficult to track if you're trying to model your own, uh, your own uh, Kubernetes infrastructure. So watch for the flags. They, they appear and disappear at a moment's notice. Um, and Chuck mentioned at the last talk we had one of the one of our um, our, our customers were, was rebooting uh, while he was doing Kubernetes operations, and that left his etcd um, database in an incomplete state. So we we found out that that was not something you want to do. We're going to look into um, you know getting that uh, fixing that in the future, so we can't <clears throat> get into that op that that problem again. And then. Um, <laughs> It's a funny story, one of my colleagues started up a large cluster while he was on a conference call to do a demonstration of, of our Kubernetes, and he did it on his own laptop, and he accidentally deployed a bigger cluster than his laptop could handle, and so it brought his laptop down, and he was not able to do the demonstration. He, uh, he picked the wrong, the wrong size of his cluster, so don't do that while you're on a conference call. It will run on your laptop, but you have to make sure you have enough resources to, to make that happen. So. <clears throat> All right, so kube control is a command line interface for running uh, commands against uh, Kubernetes. It's a small client program written in Go, um, and it talks directly to the kube API server uh, through REST API. So you don't need to have kube control here, but if you, if you uh, already have a REST client that you, you like to use, or if, you're, if your product speaks REST, you can speak directly to the API server and that would be fine, but kube control is, is what we use for debugging and, and for adding, uh, adding different things to the uh, model or to the, to the Kubernetes pods. So familiar, familiarize yourself with Kubernetes or kube control and it's uh, many subcommands. Um, alternately, if you know how to speak to etcd, you can also uh, insert things into the etcd database to deploy things in Kubernetes. There, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do this in, again in production, but this is something that if you know enough about Kubernetes, you can create objects inside that directory and then it'll deploy, uh, Kubernetes uh, scheduler will deploy things. So, um, and something our, 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 our Juju solution does is if you have everything TLS wrapped and it's a good production server, you're gonna need to have the keys and all the IP addresses in, of, your, of your masters in um, a kube config file. And we do that uh, within Juju, and you can just with one command you can download that to your laptop and run these from your laptop. So, um, some common commands we use for debugging and fixing things: uh, kube control describe. <coughs> Obviously, that one um, will get the details of a, of a pod for you for that you've defined, so you can see IP addresses, things like that. Um, a lot of Kubernetes things use labels. Um, that will be in the describe uh, command. Um, we found that kube, using kube apply or kube control apply is, is better than kube con control create because if, if it's item potent. So if you've already created it, running create on that same model will fail and that will fail some of our scripts. So we, we've changed everything to use kube control apply. That's a, that's a nice tip. Um, <coughs> kube control ex exec, that's a lot like docker run or docker exec if you're familiar with those commands. So that'll let you go into the pod or the container and, and, and putter around if you, if you don't know what's going on or you want to debug things. Um, also, kube control logs um, is a very, uh, a very, good, very good one to, uh, to know. So these are common commands that we use on a day-to-day -day basis when we're debugging our, pro our stuff. So um, future items. So we're talking about uh, going um, going on with other logging and monitoring solutions such as Prometheus and Nagios, uh, we're working on those uh, currently. Um, we're we're working on getting it running on other architectures as well. PowerPC 64 LE and System 390X. Those are uh, those are IDM architectures. Um, we've got a partnership with them. We're working on getting those running. Uh, we're working on getting uh, stuff packaged into different formats. Um, there's a, the snap packaging. We're looking at uh, trying to get Kubernetes components delivered with snaps. Um, and uh, Chuck might have mentioned in his last talk, we're working on etcd3. That's not compatible with etcd 2.x. So there will be a, a non-compatibility thing there. And hopefully 
with the operations that we build in, you can just back up your etcd2 database and restore it with an etcd3 uh, cluster, and that might, hopefully that'll work. So, but don't hold me to that. We're working on it. So, um, we're also looking forward to, to supporting other uh, CNI plugins such as Calico and Weave um, uh, officially. So, those are those are in the works. So, those are other networking options for our cluster. So. So if you're an expert in TLS or you need or you have other expertise as an operator, we would love to love to have some um, some contributions here. So if you want to contribute to the Kubernetes project, um, this is a good way to do it. Uh, <coughs> we're looking for uh, even if you have a component, let's say you're working on a on a system that integrates with Kubernetes, we'd be we'd be happy to talk to you and help you work on a component. Um, we call those charms, and then that would integrate in the Juju model. Um, uh, if you're not technical, or if you have, if you have, uh, you know, find gaps, or or we have, we know of gaps in the documentation. There's a link there for editing the documentation. Um, uh, but again, since we're upstream, all these uh, you can create bugs or or feature requests in the upstream project, um, which is right here. So the operations are in the repository. That's in uh, GitHub at the Kubernetes, the Kubernetes. Uh, <coughs> Kubernetes, Kubernetes uh, project. Uh, create issues, pull requests, what you need right there. If you wanted to try this out, it's as simple as a couple of steps here. Uh, sudo install uh, conjure up, and then uh, conjure up Kubernetes. Um, and Marco showed a, a, an a installation of Kubernetes earlier today. Uh, with that, I think that's the end of my talk, so thanks for attending. I'm open to questions. Uh, you can find us in Pound Juju. There's the Juju mailing list, and we're in the Google special interest groups, uh, SIG cluster ops, SIG cluster lifecycle, and SIG on-prem. So if there's any questions, we hang out in Slack on there, and we attend those meetings. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to you either now or at the in the developer room um, later today or tomorrow. I'll be here for the whole conference. So. Is there any other questions? Anybody have questions? Yes. Uh, could you go back to the canonical distribution? Do I get the, the names right? Yep. The. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. This one. Oh, oh okay. That's that's, okay. that's good. Okay. Yep. Um, so y you said that the the certificates are distributed by etcd. Oh, I'm sorry. I, they're distributed by EZRSA. I may have made the mistake that that's an open VPN product. Um, is EZRSA. Yeah, and, that's and so they're, they're, they're sent over the relationships. Yes, that's right. Yep, and, and that's what the uh, upstream Kubernetes project did. So I went through and I read the, 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 the recommended way to set it up, and then we, we encapsulated all, that oper all those operations into a charm that we have that's at easy RSA. Yeah. And, and we can run that one in, in LexD. It doesn't have to run on a, on a specific server or anything. That's, uh, that's one we can co-locate on, onto other servers. Yep. And is, is is that something that you could swap out and, and swap like a, yes. a, a let's encrypt? Exactly. Yeah. And, and we were looking also at Vault. Uh, so we were thinking of Vault or let's encrypt. Um, but we, we, again, the Kubernetes uh, uh, team doesn't have uh, let's encrypt uh, you know, instructions and things like that. So we, at, at some point, yes, we certainly uh, swap that out and then exchange the relationship or the certificates on the relationship just like that. Yep. It's okay. very pluggable. I think the biggest problem with Let's Encrypt is it requires F, uh, fully qualified domain names in order to generate certificates. So unless every single one of your component is mapped to a proper DNS entry name that you can generate certs for, it becomes kind of complex to set up, unfortunately. It's really good for a lot of other things, but for internal cluster IP addresses, it kind of falls down. Is that every machine or every... Uh, every every component that requires... So yeah, every component that requires a TLS certificate in order to communicate with. So yeah. that's... I mean, in the stack, it's what? It's like everything. Yeah, yeah. It would be it would be a lot, but I mean those are those are technical limitations we can work out. Um, we just haven't applied a lot of effort there. Uh, the the docs still have uh, easy RSA in there, but we could certainly use like encrypt or Vault. You know that is the, that's that's a pluggable part of our model. So it doesn't depend on that. They just simply need certificates. So if if we had a different way of of, of assigning certificates, if somebody had a proprietary way, we could write a charm that did their certificates in a proprietary way and. And would distribute those to all the all the parts of the cluster, yeah. and that would be fine. Yep. Yeah. 
And ab about the, the flannel charm, is yep. this something that, that could be used um, to connect uh, like XD containers together on the cloud like Amazon? Because yep. the issue there is that if you deploy in LXD containers, then the LXD containers can only talk to the, the host and yep. not to other hosts. Yeah. Yep. So absolutely, you could put you could just deploy flannel. You'll get yep. a subnet, you'll get a bridge device, and if you bind your LXD containers yep. to that bridge, they'll have IP addresses that are addressable and encapsulated across the cluster. Right. And and flannel lets everybody talk to everybody. And in some cases that's not what you want to, you want, right? We've also we've also taken this out. If you take this out, flannel out, you put in calico. Calico has uh, policies, and you can say, okay, these containers can talk to these containers, but you know that's it. You know, I'm only allowing these these containers to talk to them. So flannel is a is a bit broad right now. Um, we want to use the other other SDNs so that we can we can narrow the scope of the communication so that we can get more isolation and and, and you know reduce network bandwidth on the on the cluster. So, <clears throat> but flannel right now is again the the upstream recommendation and. We are just trying to experiment getting the other ones. We do have Calico we're working on, you know, like other ones like Weave and things like that. Yeah, so. yeah. Having that isolation would be really useful for us. Yep. Be because we, we, we would like to use Kubernetes as a platform, as a service. Yep. But where we get to control who can, what can talk to what. Yep. So you, you can define that in Kubernetes, mm -hmm. but I guess if you use the final backend, then that just means that the IP addresses get known, but if they would have find another way to get the IP addresses, then they would still be able to talk to each other. Right, right. And so, yeah, so that's why we've done uh, some preliminary study with uh, Calico, and you can just pull that flannel out and put Calico in there, and it, it'll, it works So in our solution. so. Is, is there, are there any plans to automate the creation of client certificates to connect to the Kubernetes cluster than without kubectl? That's a good question. Um, I, don't, I don't have anything on my roadmap right now, but that could the be... The short good. answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Being able to dynamically create new user certs and stuff, like X509 certs and stuff, absolutely, yeah. Um, it is on the roadmap, but it's not for the immediate 1.6.0 release. We could bump it up. We could chat about it. I mean, we're open for feedback. That's a big pain point for people, for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But etcd is, is iterating to uh, 3.0 for so the 1.6 version of, of Kubernetes is almost exclusively for the the third release of etcd. So that's going to be a big change, and it's incompatible with the old one. So we're working ramping yeah. up on that right now. Yeah. So yep. And ha have you looked at the Kubernetes also has this idea of a proxy service. Mm -hmm. Which is like like a service with unmanaged by Kubernetes, but you can connect it to services inside of Kubernetes. You can connect it to pods. Mm -hmm. are, are there any plans to to integrate that with the the Juju relationships, where, where you could connect this this proxy service inside of Kubernetes to a charm? Um, we've thought about that, yes, but I don't know how 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 soon that would be on the roadmap. Um, you're we right. need, we need use be, cases and stuff. Like, yeah, uh, I mean, we, need, what you we need some use cases, but yeah, that would be, we do have, We do use Kube Proxy um, right now, um, but you're right, to, to connect to other Juju services, we don't have that, that bit just yet, and that certainly is something we could add. I just don't know how we, what we'd be connecting to and how we'd want to expose that yeah. through Juju. I'll, yeah. I'll yeah. talk to you about it. That'd be great, yeah. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, yes, go ahead. What would happen if uh, Easier Say Machine died? If which? Uh, if Easier Say Machine died, uh, like uh, PKI Master. Yep. Well, uh, Easier Say, so that one, that one comes up, and again, that one doesn't need a separate server, but if it, if it did die, you would, have to, um, you would have to regenerate the certificates and send them all out again. So, um, Right now, if EasyRSA, EasyRSA just does, when, when a new server connects to the cluster, it generates the certificates for them at that time. So if EasyRSA died, all new ones wouldn't have the, the, the cluster, or the, the certificate until you, would, until you put would it back. Would it, would it break the running cluster, or would the, other, would the existing the certificates still communicate with each other? The existing certificates would still communicate with, them, with each other, but the new ones probably wouldn't. I right, guess. so you wouldn't, be able to, you wouldn't be able to generate new certificates, right? right. Your existing ones would still be valid, right. and when you replaced it, it would regenerate the PKI infrastructure and distribute new certs to It would do new certs to everybody else, the new ones that came in. So the new ones wouldn't be able to do that, but 
we've we've done some um, prototyping of, of running EZRSA on a LexD container on one of the masters or one of the other systems that that is is in there. So we we've done some um, some prototyping there, and it's not a, a terribly busy service. It's it's a very s small one. Yes. Is it fair to say that uh, we've got an open bug about that, so we are working towards making that with a disaster recovery plan, so where you yeah. can back up your KKI? That's right. Yeah, we are, and we 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 are. We can make an action on that charm, so we we save off the uh, the PKI as much as as much as Chuck talked about uh, for the etcd database. We can make a snapshot of it, and then we can restore from that. We just we don't have that in there just yet, but we can make that as a as a backup restore operation that that you this would be you know how would you 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 get everything set up and then you back everything up right, and it could make a bunch of actions that run on these. Uh, charms have a notion of an action. Where again, it's operations that we can run in a batch and just say, all right, run this one time. I want to run my backup of this uh, of my PKI so that if, if I do lose it, I can restore it again. But yeah, we, at this time, we don't have that in. So, uh, any other questions for Matt? We're we'll running towards the top of the hour. Uh, if you have any other questions, um, there's a workshop room with the so the Kubernetes guys are back there and other people from these kind of general. Discipline. So if you have questions, you want to work on a hacking session, get a cluster stood up today, we could do it in a couple commands in 15 minutes. Uh, we'll give you some free cloud credentials as well. Uh, with that, though, I think that's it. Unless anyone has any last questions for Matt. Ooh. All right. Thank you, Matt. Right. Thank you guys very much.